Uh, so, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ben, uh, Ben Nuttall. I'm a software engineer in BBC News Labs. Uh, I, you might have seen me speak at EuroPython before. I, I did a lot of work with, uh, when I did a lot of talks when I was at the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, so I used to work there. And I'm based in Cambridgeshire in the UK. And you can see my website and Twitter GitHub links there. Uh, so, of course, I would love to have been at the conference uh, in real life. I've been looking forward to coming back to EuroPython uh, post-pandemic. Um, I've been, obviously, in real life since 2019 in Basel. Unfortunately, I recently got COVID for the first time, um, so that was a real shame. Uh, fortunately, I, I'm getting better, and I did test negative today, so uh, hopefully I'll be uh, on the mend now. Um, so... <clears throat> Uh, so yeah, and a big thank you for Europe, I think, for making this possible. Um, normally, I think before the pandemic, we wouldn't have, a speaker wouldn't have been able to present uh, remotely uh, because of the nature of how things have changed. So I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, so a little bit about uh, where I work. So the, in BBC News Labs, we're a multidisciplinary innovation team within BBC News and BBC R&D, Research and Development. Uh, we build prototypes of new audience experiences, new things, new ways to get um, content to audiences. Uh, we come up with solutions to help journalists with their jobs and help automate things that they would, would normally take them a lot of time uh, and speed, you know, uh, improve their processes and help uh, make things easier for them to get on with the, the things that they need to do. And we also do a lot of research and, and we try out lots of ideas that uh, don't necessarily immediately solve problems, but we think there's something, something worth investigating and seeing what we can do. Uh, we like to build prototypes and just uh, see what happens. Uh, we've got a website, bbcnewslabs.co.uk. We write up all our projects and, um, and write blog posts about uh, the ways we work. And we have a presence on Twitter, BBC News Labs. Um, so uh, what I'm going to be talking about kind of covers uh, some projects I've worked on in recent months, um, particularly these three. So uh, we, we did a project called IDX, which and the, also this kind of gives you a context to uh, the kind of problems we're, we're working with. Uh, so IDX, identify the X, means uh, was a project where we tried to automate the clipping of um, live content in live radio uh, to get it ready for social media. So if something is said on air that um, would be worthwhile sort of taking that clip from, from something, whether it's local radio or national radio, um, it's nice to be able to resurface that individual clip of that person saying a thing or a whole interview or something like that and be able to tweet that out, you know, as a, as a, as a, an audio clip. And we, the process for doing that is a kind of real painstaking long process that um, takes a lot of effort and lots of steps. And, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things, it's, it's kind of, it's worth doing for that one time you really want to do it. But sometimes it would be nice if it was just automated so you didn't have to spend all that time doing it for just smaller things that might not be as, as big impacts uh, or you might not think as, be, as big impacts as they could be. Um, so that was a really interesting project. Um, uh, another project, Mozro Manager, which is a, a running order management software. So we uh, we use this to process TV and radio running orders, so the plans of what's going to be in a TV or radio program, uh, and extract the structured metadata about what was actually in that program, and give us all that metadata and see what we can what we can do to chop that content up or uh, help people find bits of content that they might be interested in. Uh, and also a project around BBC Images, the search tool that uh, journalists use to find the appropriate images that they want to use in, a, in an article on the website. Um, and we built an image metadata enrichment pipeline to enrich the, uh, the metadata that we have about uh, images in that system and uh, you know, make it easier for them to find what they're looking for. Uh, and we kind of, uh, these three projects use the kind of um, approaches that I'm gonna be talking about in this talk. Um, so first of all, I want to explain how our project cycles work. So we kind of generally, well, this is how we used to work. I've got the next slide will show you the sort of slightly tweaked version of this. So we used to work in six week uh, projects. So we'd have three two week sprints. And then we'd follow that, that up with an extra two weeks of kind of, you know, tweaking things and wrapping things up. Or if you hadn't quite finished it, work, continue to work, to work on something. Uh, or if you had finished, just being able to move on and do something something else. Um, and more recently, we moved to a, a we introduced a kind of uh, bookended uh, version of that. So there's still the six weeks in the middle, the two weeks, the three two week sprints. We now introduced a, a week dedicated to research before you get started, 
because and that gives you time to uh, speak to journalists and figure out what's going on and uh, figure out the systems before you actually start your sprint planning. Um, and then we have a week to just wrap everything up. Uh, and then we, we have uh, a period that after that kind of big project is complete, we have a small project cycle, just two weeks. You can pick up something new or um, try out a new idea, that something that might become a big project in future and that kind of thing. This kind of helps us not just continuously run over projects going back to back using that extra two weeks. Um, and it gives us a way to, uh, you know, to build up that momentum in the first week and wrap up without adding new features in that final week. And that seems to work really well. Um, so um, projects tend to start with uh, ideation. So there's always something to something we, that we're beginning with. So um, a, a, a kind of rough idea of working in a particular area or working with a particular system or in a particular problem domain. Um, but from there, it's kind of down to the team members to determine you know, what it is they're going to spend their time doing and what they're going to try and achieve and what they're trying, trying to build. Um, so we, we kind of have these department-wide objectives of what, you know, things that BBC News is trying to do. So you know, trying to reach underserved audiences, for instance, is a big part of what we're, what we're trying to do. Um, we kind of start with, start with those and we devise how might we statements. So how might we achieve certain soja? How might we provide, find ways to get content to this type of people, that kind of thing. Um, start with um, how might we statements and come up with loads of ideas that might you know, off the top of your head, what would solve that problem or what might be worth investigating? And we have this concept of explode and converge. So you start really, really broad, um, thinking about all sorts of different things, really, really, really wide thinking, cast the net really, really far. Don't worry about how stupid an idea sounds, just get everything down. And then, you know, do a sort of separate session after that. Okay, let's converge down onto these certain things. Let's look in, you know, these are all quite um, similar ideas or you know, in the same, same vein, trying to achieve the same thing. How might we actually do that and kind of converge into certain ideas based on that? Um, then once we've kind of got uh, it pinned down, what we're, what we're trying to achieve in this project cycle, um, determine what the objectives are and what we're actually trying to achieve and write that down. Um, then we start the project and we do, we do the research week, which I'm going to be talking about next. Um, then once you've done the research week, it's a case of you know, bootstrapping the tech that, you need, that you're going to be building on. <coughs> um, doing little what we call spikes, which is, I think is a really helpful um, use of, use of a, a bit of time. So just investigating as, uh, investing a small amount of time and just trying something out. Um, seeing, you know, is this technology suitable for this kind of thing? Can we do this kind of thing? And just trying something out tech-wise tech uh, and then coming back to the team saying, yeah, I've tried this, I spent two days doing it and this is what I think we should do or I don't think it's suitable or yes, I think we can go ahead with this um, and presenting it back to the rest of the team to work on. Um, then uh, at the end of your research week, you, you know, you're doing those spikes and um, you start you know, writing out what the what the sprint goals are. For, so for the next two weeks, what are we going to try and achieve? What are we going to focus on? Uh, and then and then it just comes down to ticketing and starting picking up tickets in that sprint. Uh, so about the research week. So the main things to do there are um, identify the stakeholders. Uh, so work out, you know, is it is it certain types of journalists in local radio that you need to be working with? They're going to be using this this tool that you're going to build, or they're your kind of your audience. Um, Set up calls with journalists um, and, you know, start talking to them, start building those relationships um, and asking questions, figuring out what it is that they have problems with uh, or what they're trying to achieve or what, um, you know, everything that they know about uh, what you're what you're trying to uh, discover. Um, and uh, learn about the existing systems that you're working with. So we generally don't tend to, you know, just turn up with a whole new piece of software and say we want to use, use this instead uh, we've built it instead of that other system we use we tend to try and avoid if at all possible avoid them changing their workflows so we build on using existing tools and extracting data from those existing tools they use uh, or automating the passing of data from that tool to the other tool that kind of thing so that we're um, able to let them get on without having to learn new things uh, and, and stop the, the, the system, stop using the systems they're already using and already used to um, also getting, you know, getting access to those systems. Sometimes uh, you need to, you know, dedicate a bit of time to making sure you've got access and getting hold of the data you need and getting to understand and getting to know them. Um, and also setting up uh, shadowing. So that's uh, what we're talking about next. So um, sitting down with um, a journalist uh, or, or a producer or anyone who works in that kind of environment and watching them do their job and just sitting, sitting, watching, asking questions, 
um, just being present in the room while they're doing that. Now, this is something because um, I started uh, this job a couple of months before the pandemic. So I never did any shadowing um, until very recently. So this has become a real um you know, a real boost to um, my kind of awareness of, how, you know, what, what it's really like working on the newsroom floor or in a local radio station. Um, so actually going there, turning up, uh, just sitting and watching them use the tools, uh, working out what their workflows are, um, looking for any pain points, inefficiencies, slowness, manual work that, you know, you think could be automated and just finding ways that we could actually make that, make their lives better, make their lives easier. Um, and, you know, it's uh, sometimes it's a case of, well, this thing takes you an hour currently, we could automate it. So it just happens out of the tools that you did, you know, the, the stuff you already did um, that you don't, wouldn't have to dedicate any extra time to doing that. Um, sometimes it's a thing that, you know, it's just not worth doing and, you know, because it takes so long. So if we can just provide all these things for them that they can use, um, can make their lives a lot easier and get more stuff out um, to audiences. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, a lot of the AWS services that we use for, uh, for rapid pro prototyping. Um, so this, uh, a lot of what, what we use is things like Lambda functions. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot more in detail about each of these, but Lambda functions, uh, step functions and state machines, um, databases that AWS provides, um, things like S3 for, for file storage and SNS, SQS, that's notifications and queue systems. Um, and uh, and CloudWatch, which is a, a, a AWS's logging tool. I'm going to be going into more detail about each of those. So Lambda um, is a really cool thing. So it's um, it's being able to run code without it being on a server as such. So this is what we call serverless. Um, so it's just a piece of code, uh, a function that just you know it's just a thing that does a particular job and can be triggered sort of asynchronously or you know separately from anything else. Um, and you just you just get billed for the compute time that you use. So if you have a little job that goes right, every time a, a photo arrives in S3, send it into this Lambda, do the do the function. So you know I don't know uh, what was this example? Uh, Lambda is triggered. Lambda runs image resizing code. This is one of the examples from AWS. Um, just resizes that images to uh, that image that's been uploaded to various sizes and and just spits that out and sends it on to where it needs to be. Um, and it's just that implementation of that tiny little thing, that small task, rather than that being on a server that might get overloaded with, you know, might be sitting there for a month not getting used, and then all of a sudden get a 1,000 requests because somebody's just uploaded a load of photos. So the way Lambda works is there's just a separate instance of that code being run every single time um, that, it, that it's called. Uh, that it's triggered. You can you can write lambdas in Python, in Node, in Go, all sorts of other things. Um, so it's really handy for this kind of thing. Um, so as I say, you pay for compute time rather than uh, paying for provisioning of servers. So uh, and it's and it's very very cheap to run as well. <clears throat> uh, so step functions and state uh, or state machines are uh, a kind of workflow for lambdas essentially um, in AWS. So you can design a workflow of you know. This function gets called, and then and this, and then it passes data onto this function. Then, then it calls this function, and then it sets off a parallel job, and this thing happens. And you can design what your workflow is of how some code should, or how a, a sort of procedure should be structured, um, whether it's data processing pipelines or just a series of jobs being done to something. Um, that means you can kind of implement something and just have a lambda that just does one one small thing, um, and then passes on to the next thing, and that has its own job, and that can do its own thing in its own way without being this kind of uh, monolith um, you know, system which uh, which does everything. You can kind of isolate all the little environments. They could even be implemented in different languages, if you like, um, and use different you know, requirements and have different dependencies and all that, all that kind of thing. You can define the behavior of how it should do retries or how it should handle failures. Uh, parallel parallelization if things don't need to depend on it, jobs don't depend on each other you can do all that, all of that kind of thing in uh, in the designer um, so here's an example of, of uh, where we've used one in the running order project so um, you kind of the way it works is you you execute the state machine with given some initial data so like you know in this case it was the run the ID of the running order and it goes and fetches that that running order file and extract some data from it, passes that on to the next piece piece of the uh, of, of the diagram. Um, 
passes the data on, um, and then there's a parallel pass. So it goes off and does two separate things. Um, and basically the whole um, Lambda, you know, kind of, uh, sorry, the whole state machine has this, uh, has a success or failure criteria um, as to whether everything's been done. And you, you basically get a thing saying whether the state machine execution succeeded or failed. And, you, and if it fails at any point, so here's an example of failure, you can see where it fails and you can just click on that and see the exception of what caused that, uh, that failure. So you can see in the larger picture what, what actually happened. You've got really easy access to all the data that, was, you know, that it was passed, uh, the exception information, and click through to the, the Lambda logs to go and see exactly what came out of the logs for each specific Lambda. Um, so it works something like this. You, have, you define a Lambda handler function. Um, uh, that takes uh, an event, which is the data that it's being passed in. And essentially, what you might do is take, take that uh, piece of that data that it was given, do, a, do something to it, uh, and then uh, push, that, push that, ex that new data onto that, onto that event and pass that on, and then the next Lambda receives the new, bigger version of the event. Um, we're actually using something called Pydantic um, to uh, do the data parsing. So this is ideal for what we use because you can validate and um, sort of uh, you can you can validate the the lambda's input data and also the configuration, so the envi the environment variables that define how that how that thing should behave. Um, so Pydantic works uh, by defining models using uh, type hints. So this is really easy. Uh, you just say, okay, the input event takes a file ID, which is a string, one of these, one of these, which is a date time, one of these, which is a time delta. It even does all the parsing of those types for you. So obviously it's coming in as JSON and uh, it will just take that date JSON string uh, and turn it into a date time or into a time delta object uh, or a, you know, a list of strings or whatever. And then you've just got some data, you know exactly what shape that data is. Um, you can also define optional fields. And, um, and so all you need to do is pass in that in, that entire uh, all those keys from the uh, keys and values from the um, event dictionary that comes in, and then you and then you have access to it uh, rather than using dictionary notation uh, using dot notation. So you can and you can also do nested uh, structures as well. So it's really nice to nice to use, and you just know you've got the right data that you need for to pass it on to the next stage. Um, it also uh, handles settings, so uh, your configuration um, in environment variables, which is easy to do in, in lambdas. It's generally, how you how you provide certain um, distinct settings between different environments, test and live, for instance. Um, and so th this example takes uh, there's a, there's an env prefix mos here, the name of the project. So take any environment variables, um, which if you're running locally might come from a .env file, but uh, otherwise in the lambda context they'll be coming from um, from the environment variables themselves. Um, so anything that starts mos underscore goes, goes into here, uh, but without, without the prefix. So uh, mos cert file path as, a, as, a, uh, as an environment variable would get loaded into here. And then I just made a little shortcut to uh, cert, which means uh, go, go and uh, make a tuple out of these two bits of data and return that as the certificate. And then I'll use that in something like this. So if I need to send a request to um, where I, I need to authenticate using a certificate that is provided by uh, the uh, provided within the Lambda, um, then just use settings dot because that's looking up uh, this thing here from the environment variables. Uh, but it also validates that you've got everything you need to run the code. So that's really handy. Uh, so AWS databases we've used in various projects. We did do a lot of stuff with DynamoDB for a while, um, kind of hit the edges of that without sort of um, getting too much, into too much details and felt, felt like we were kind of lacking um, something. We tried out um, TimeStream for one uh, project and that worked quite well for the thing we used it for, but it wasn't very extensible for, um, for, for larger use. Really, I kind of always um, wanted to go, you know, to start to be using a, a SQL databases um, like Postgres. But uh, we, we we sort of struggled to get you know around you know these short lived prototypes. We didn't really want we don't really be wanting to be uh, spending time managing infrastructure and, and that kind of thing and dealing with instances and and having to shut them down at the end of projects and things like that. Um, so anything like DynamoDB, which is just it just works out of the box, serverless, um, and you're not getting billed for instances that are left on. Um, is a really handy um, way to work. So we found uh, that there was a 
um, a serverless option available for RDS, the, the managed SQL database services. Uh, so you can you can run uh, Amazon Aurora Postgres um, uh, serverless in serverless mode. Um, and you, the way that works is you provide the uh, specify the capacity range and scaling configuration, and you enable something called the Web Service Data API, and that just means you can access it through essentially through the Bota three library. Um, and obviously, there's there's various bridges available to for your your, your standard ways of working. Um, and all you do is that, uh, in your cloud formation, so the infrastructure def defined for your Lambda, you just add on this as one of your resources. Say, yeah, I'd like a database, please. Um, here's its capacity settings and things. And you've got a whole SQL database available to play with. And we'll even drop down to using zero capacity units uh, if you tick the right if you, know, if you tick the right boxes or set the right settings in here. Um, and that allows you to just, it, you know, once the project's over, if it's not getting run anymore, you're just not getting built for any usage whatsoever. Um, and you get access to it through the console, but of course you can uh, also access via uh, Bojo3 bridge uh, or preferably using uh, Aurora Data API uh, from PyPy, or if you're using SQL Alchemy, the, uh, there's an SQL Alchemy bridge for that as well. And you connect to this using the AWS Secrets Manager, so you don't actually have to pass around credentials and, and things like that as well, or, or even open up uh, ports or, you know, uh, security groups and VPCs and things like that, which were the kinds of things we wanted to avoid in these short-lived projects. Um, so we have a, something called the, the News Labs Apps Portal, which is really handy. It's, it's essentially a, a long-lived long -lived, lived project, uh, an EC2 web server that hosts static files that you put into S S3. Just means every project can just reuse that infrastructure uh, you can just throw some HTML into there, throw, create a static site, and some of the other team build React apps and, and things, and they can just easily deploy them to that portal. Uh, and it just means that without creating new infrastructure, you just dump some files in there, and you've got some web presence for your data for, or for your project. And it's, you know that it's not public. It's behind either BBC Login, which is a two-factor authentication login system for BBC staff, or if you've got a certificate on your machine, you can get access through that. And that's really handy. It means we can do things like this. So we use um, a, a, a template generator called Chameleon uh, Python library, which um, basically we kind of devise a, um, a website content structure. So that might be, you know, I want all the, the list of all the programs on the, on the first page and within each of those, I want all the list of episodes that we've processed their running orders. Um, and we, we create chameleon templates for each, for each page type. So the episode page, the home page, the brands page. Um, and you, we create um, a logic layer for retrieving that data, whether it's coming from the database or coming from the running orders or something. Um, create that layer for how, how you define what, you know, how to write that page out or how to pass the data into that template. And, um, and then you know, create a Lambda that just takes that logic and says, right, um, at the end of the state machine, once I've processed all the data, and I've got all the bits of the data that I need. Um, I've written it to the database. I want to write out the web page. Um, okay, so I've processed a new episode, so let's write out that new episode page. Uh, let's update the brand page to include the link to that new episode, and let's update the home page because it has all the uh, stats on it or something like that. Um, and whatever the logic is for what you, what you need, define that in the Lambda and also usually tend to create a command line version for if you ever need to just re rebuild the whole website. And that uh, seems to be a really good way of working because then you don't actually have a sort of, um, you know, a, a Python like web framework running that, that could go down. Basically, if, um, uh, if a Lambda write fails and the, the, the state machine fails, you've just got um, something that needs fixing to rewrite that one page, but everything else is still up because it's just static, static HTML. Uh, we also use um, something called Structlog, which is um, for structured logging. Um, so this this is uh, this looks really great when you're um, running locally. You get to see all the relevant information, and it's all coloured and, um, and nice and nice and structured, and you kind of see what's going on in your programs, uh, which really encourages good logging practice. And um, it also supports JSON logging, uh, which is ideal for when you're running code in AWS because you can access um, and search and even search the structured logs in uh, in CloudWatch. So we just have a bit of configuration uh, that says if you if you've enabled JSON logging. Um, just add these uh, processes and um, configure struct log that way. And that has um, created a, a JSON renderer. So the top one here is what it looks like if you run uh, one of our lambdas locally. You just get a bit of information out and you get these kind of um, these structured bits. That, uh, these are the bits of data I chose to, as well as just the, the, the info message. 
uh, the the bits of data I chose to include on that line. And then when it comes out as JSON, you actually get this kind of collapsible thing. And you can even search for like, give me all the logs where the brand PID was this one. And you can see all of that, uh, all of the log entries that had that in, uh, for instance. Um, so for uh, I, I talked about Pydantic settings earlier. Um, so uh, for connecting to our database, so here I've got an example where uh, it, instead of just moz underscore being the prefix, it's mozdb underscore, and then it's mozdb underscore arn, and the secret arn, which is the, the secrets manager uh, to get the credentials for the database and uh, the database name. Um, and so just using that as well just means you... Um, You've got this additional thing looking for specific types of settings for when you need to talk to the database. Um, we're using SQL Alchemy, uh, which allows us to um, define what a table structure looks like. This is quite similar to Pydantic. Um, so you just define what all the columns are and what the types are and what the relations are as well. And then you can do um, you can connect to uh, create you know connect to your your database engine using the the post uh, the Postgres Aurora Data API bridge. Um, and you could do things like um, query for an episode, um, selecting from that table where the episode PID is, a, is, a, the, is the given PID, um, and execute that query and return the row, and you get all the data um, really easily. Um, so, and then there's, there's also something we've been looking at recently, uh, which is um, lambdas can actually, you can actually provide um, a function URL for your function. So, uh, you could even, you know, you can implement a, um, so it's a, it's a dedicated HTTP endpoint for your Lambda, um, which allows you to, you know, build a, a RESTful API, for instance, um, you know, in this serverless context. So without having to spin up servers and have dedicated machine running your, your API, um, you can just define it in a Lambda. And with that endpoint, it means you can just throw data at that, at that API and, and get your data back. Um, so this um, allows us to, um, and with fa fast API, this is kind of a, the easiest way to get this done, um, which is also built on Pydantic, which you know makes it easy to define the inputs and outputs using Pydantic models. And it's a self-documenting project, and it's got all the bells and whistles, and it's it's really really good. Um, so essentially, with all of these tools that we're you know talking about, you you, you get practically for free, you get, you're getting a, um, a, rest, a serverless API for your serverless database. And you, you, know, you haven't had to manage all these, uh, all these you know, resources and, uh, and, and instances, which is really, really handy for, for the kind of rapid prototyping we do. Um, and you can easily add authentication to that as well. And just to, just to finish off, um, just the, the learnings from these projects, because we, you know, we, we work fast and we, we've just got these sort of eight week project cycles, uh, trying to achieve something in that small amount of time without getting your head, you know, uh, bogged down in the detail of the infrastructure and all that kind of thing. You get a chance to just try new things every project cycle. Um, you take those learnings onto the next project. So there have been times when we've kind of taken one approach and thought, you know, this is this this seems like the right way to do it. You've kind of had gone through some pain points in that, and you know, it slowed you down a bit. And but then you you know you finish that project, you move on to the next one, and you go. You know, actually, it would have been better if we'd have used SQL Alchemy instead of this other thing um, in this project. That enabled us to get a, uh, to hit the ground running and um, get get going really quickly on that next project. Um, we using spikes to um, to try out ideas, just spend a day or two just researching something, presenting you know like a one pager, explaining your thought process and what you learned to the rest of the team um, is really really handy. Um, no project is perfect, so you know we're not striving for per perfection in any of these. We're just iterating every single project cycle. Um, we don't tend to have um, any you know hard and fast rules. Um, just determine what's good practice and keep improving on that. Um, we don't get bogged down in this is the only framework we're allowed to use or anything like that. We do lots of knowledge sharing. So um, if somebody learns something in the team and thinks, oh, you know. It would be beneficial to lots of people in the team to uh, to get to know about, uh, about this thing. I've spent my two days researching it, or we did it in this whole project. I'm going to share to the rest of the team what we learned. Really, really useful doing um, doing that and um, prioritizing for delivery. So um, making sure what you know you're aiming you you know what you know what you're aiming for, what you're trying to achieve, and the most important uh, and, and the, the final thing I'm going to mention is making the best use of um, the research week. And and the rapid week. So don't don't be um, don't get started too early if you haven't spoken to your end users or your the people you're going to be working with. 
um, really get, get drill down those those um, use cases and things and using the wrap-up week wisely so that you actually do finish on time and don't feel the need you know for an extra two weeks um, so that's all from me and I think we're, we've got time for questions um. well that was a fantastic talk Ben I definitely learned a lot however we don't have time for questions, so if anyone wants to ask questions, uh, you could please do it in the Liffy boardroom for, or on the Zoom call. Uh, is that is that good? So yeah, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Ben.